Welcome to the Startup Grind. We grew up in a place called Tipperary, which is rural in Ireland, not quite as rural as where I'm from in Donegal, but um, you, uh, you know, it's not exactly a tech hub. And I can imagine that when you were growing up, there weren't many or obvious candidates for mentorship or for advice in terms of industry mentorship. Right. So just tell me a little bit more about the atmosphere that you had when you were growing up and that preceded your career in sure, tech. Sure, sure. Before that, I should say it's probably a dangerous idea to have uh, somebody from Ireland interview somebody else from Ireland. <laughs> and we'll probably both revert to sort of our, our original impenetrable accent. So um, I don't know, sh shout things at us or something if, if you can't understand. Um, but in terms of growing up in Tipperary, I mean, I actually suspect it's kind of similar to, to what a lot of Americans had uh, in, in other parts of the U.S. And that sort of, it's not as if sort of everywhere in the U.S. Is, is like Silicon Valley, right? And there's people from West Virginia or North Dakota or whatever. Um, and for us, uh, this is myself and John, um, my co-founder, we, we grew up in Tipperary. Um, it was pretty hard to get an internet connection. Um, uh, I remember we, we sort of, for the first couple of years, we just couldn't get any internet connection because the phone line was, wasn't good enough. Uh, and then eventually we got like a, a 3.5 K a second connection. And so I used to like read books while waiting for web pages to load. Um, and, then, and then when I was 15 or 16, we, we managed to get a, a satellite internet connection, which I sort of lobbied my parents for for years. And so this is like, uh, it, was, it was a two-way connection where the, the, the like packets would go to some satellite and then down into Germany and, and, and then back. And it was, it was pretty fast. It was 512K, and so it was, it was sort of nominally broadband. But, um, but the latency, I mean, because you sort of had to go to space and back was on the order of seconds. And so it, it didn't completely solve the problem. And using SSH was terrible. Um, but in general, I mean, you're right. Like, for us, there, there was nobody really around who was very into technology. Um, and, and you know, we were sort of connected to that world and knew about that world sort of purely through the internet. Um, and uh, I guess coming here was sort of, I remember it being sort of really jarring at first where you, coming to the US, you realize that, oh, hey, there are, there are in fact people who, like <laughs> real people who are into this stuff too. And you can yeah. be around a group of them at one point, not just one of them or something. And that was so, cool. That's cool. Well, it leads me on, I suppose, to the, like, it's interesting that you talk about um, yourself and John, because I know it may seem like an obvious question, but you know, guys who start companies with their brothers are in a minority. Um, tell us a little bit more about the spectrum of the experience you had um, with John and starting Stripe and everything else that you've done back in Ireland, because I'm sure that it's, uh, it can be a, a good and a bad, uh, yeah. what are the different things? Yeah, so, so yeah, the context here is uh, John is my brother and my co-founder at Stripe. And you know, by and large, it's worked out pretty well. Uh, I guess you sort of always hear about all these co-founder spats and startups and it seems that sort of, you know, if you have a couple of co-founders, it's pretty hard to be successful without there being a falling out with at least one of them. Um, but I guess luckily, John and I like, got all of our, our desperate fights and arguments out of each other when we were out of the way when we were four. Um, and so it, it, it's actually been pretty smooth sailing at Stripe. Um, and honestly, I, I think it's, it's, like, it's so stressful, sort of every other part of having a, or like running a startup or dealing with the problems or whatever, like just being able to kind of eliminate that one concern of like, how do you work with this other person or sort of can, can you be totally honest with them or can you tell them, you know, like that shit sucks. Um, having confidence there is really helpful. Uh, it was also good that sort of, you know, John and I didn't decide to start Stripe together really because we were brothers, though I mean obviously sort of that um, it was somewhat part of it, but uh, John is also simply kind of one of the, the smartest people I know, and so I, I kind of think that even, even if we hadn't kind of had that you know, family relationship, there's, there's still actually a pretty good chance we'd have yeah. started it together. He, he's like it's, it, he's very good at what he does. Yeah. And I suppose in, as well, like it, it kind of leads me on, because you guys came from Ireland, Silicon Valley, um, you know, and how did you navigate the networks here and get those first all-important meetings. I know you had a meeting with Peter Thiel, which resulted in him investing in you. You got into Sequoia Capital, who have funded you. I mean, as a complete outsider, what was the experience like, and what did you do practically to ingratiate yourself here? Um, I'm not sure we're very ingratiated, but uh, <laughs> uh, I think the, the most important sort of single thing for us was, uh, was Y Combinator. Um, we, we, so we did one company back in, uh, in 2007 um, called uh, Octomatic, uh, which was Y Combinator backed. Uh, and sort of through that, we sort of 
got, got to like understand sort of the, the contours of Silicon Valley a little bit. And that I, I remember sort of hearing about TechCrunch for the first time and sort of being like, what's TechCrunch? And you know, someone patting my head and yeah. Um, <laughs> and it just, yeah, so, so kind of ha having that network of people who sort of knew a bit about how all of this worked and sort of, uh, I mean, I'd never heard of Sequoia Capital, right? Uh, I'd never heard of Ron Conway. I'd never heard of, of I, I can't even remember the first time I heard of Peter Thiel. Um, and, and, and just sort of, there being at YC sort of a, a group of people who are really densely connected in this network and, and sort of coming through, you know, giving talks or, or, or investing in other companies, you know, whose, whose founders were among our friends, whatever, sure. that, that was really useful. And so that company was then acquired after about a year. And, and so by the time we came to start Stripe a couple of years later, um, it, it, was, it, was, it was really helpful because we now sort of had some sense for what we were getting into and kind of just how all of this worked. Um, but I think the, if you were to sort of have, have a one word thing that, that helped us, I guess, come to understand it, it was Y Combinator. Y Combinator, yeah. okay. Um, so going back as well to, I suppose, let's talk about Stripe because one of the things that I really understood and kind of set Stripe apart for me as someone who talks to a lot of startups back in our fund in Dublin is that you know, a lot of people come to us and say, if I build this and everybody uses it, it will be awesome. And we're like, yeah. Um, but you guys have had a very novel way of getting customer acquisition. Um, and you've seemed to have focused on one particular vertical. Could you tell us more about what led up to that decision and what informed it and how, it, how right. customer acquisition went? Right. Yeah, I, I think for kind of developer-oriented services in general, or I mean any internet service, sort of the, the distribution and the customer acquisition question is, is, is obviously always pretty hard. Um, and I think that, as, as, again, especially for developer-oriented startups, uh, sort of th there's an obvious kind of temptation to, to say that I will just like build the thing and hopefully all you know, the developers will talk about themselves and, yeah. and it'll be great. Um, and, and sometimes that, that, that doesn't quite happen or doesn't happen as, as quickly as you'd like. And I think it worked or has worked decently well so far for Stripe for, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is that payment processing is just a thing that people know that they have to deal with. Like, sort of, pe people don't really think, oh, sort of, maybe I should accept payments, but you know, maybe I shouldn't or something. Like, it, it's not kind of a, it's, it's not a luxury good. It's, it's sort of a fundamental thing. It's like web hosting or something. Uh, and so I think, sort of, because people know that they need it, um, ju just sort of being present as, as sort of the best option or something, that, that works pretty well. I think also hand processing is special because online, or to a greater extent than almost anything else, um, like people associated payments in the past with, with just pain and misery and like legacy services and crappy APIs and all this stuff. And so I think that, like, uh, yeah, and when we had to sort of, you know, describe just to our friends, Stripe in the early days was sort of, we're doing payments for developers, it doesn't suck. They sort of like, that was enough, they kind of got it. It's not like, oh, you know, while well, we're doing this kind of, you know, mobile-based analytics, something, something thing. Where I mean, like maybe that's a good idea, but but sort of yeah. the person you're describing it to doesn't doesn't like know already that it's good that it's a good idea. I can I can understand why that would have a network effect, but I, like one of the things I read about you guys is that you spent literally nothing on marketing for the first when you were doing that. So yeah. what were the practical things? Did you run hackathons? What were the things you did to kind of spur that on and accelerate right. it? So so we worked for a long time and just trying to make the product. Uh, sufficiently good that friends would start to tell each other about it. Um, and we actually increased our prices to kind of force ourselves to do this. So sort of back during Stripe's um, kind of the earliest days during the beta period, uh, Stripe costs 5% plus 30 cents per transaction, which is more expensive than almost any other option. But we sort of had that as a forcing function to like force it, like was it possible to make a product that's sort of so much better than everything else that people would still use it and still tell other people about it uh, just despite having to pay 5%. Um, and, and it took a long time. Like it wasn't, it wasn't an overnight thing. Uh, we started working on Stripe in January of 2010, and we didn't launch it publicly until the end of September 2011. And so that, I mean, that was almost two years, uh, and and it was just kind of like <laughs> rinse, wash, and repeat. Uh, like we, we built it, we rebuilt it, we kind of rebuilt it again. We moved it onto different infrastructure, and we sort of kept going on until we thought that it was good enough. Um, and so I, I guess. Like kind of, and, and then sure, you know, when, w once we launched it, it started to sort of spread really quickly. But I, I guess that's b because we spent so long trying to get it to that to, to that point. I guess I, I certainly don't know of any kind of shortcut for, for getting there or, or, or easy way to do that. And I'm not even convinced that, that was the right thing to do. Like maybe we should have just kind of launched a mediocre version after three months and tried yeah. to build from there. But uh, I, I guess that, that, that's how I look at it. If in fact you spend almost two years iterating on the product and then launching it, that, that 
it, it can end up a little bit better than if you didn't. Okay, so speaking of iterations, and this is a question that's been boiling back in, in, in Dublin, and I'm sure in Europe as well, and I, I would be killed if I didn't ask you, when is Stripe coming to Europe? <laughs> Yeah, I, I basically have no more friends in Ireland anymore because there's, there's still no Stripe in Ireland. Um, like, <laughs> it's pretty much the most important thing that we're working on right now, uh, bringing Stripe to, to other countries, and obviously not just Ireland, but Europe in general and the rest of the world. Uh, and actually, I think it's, it's almost more important that we bring it to the rest of the world than that it exists in the US, in that, like, if Stripe didn't exist in the US, yeah, you'd have to use some other payment system, but I mean, there, there at least exist other payment systems. Like, you, you will be able to accept payments online, and it might be worse if it would be possible. Whereas in a lot of these other countries, uh, like, starting to accept payments online is like getting a mortgage or something, or like, you have to fill out all this paperwork and, like, be approved five months later or something like that. Um, or in some cases, it, it just, almost impossible full stop. Uh, I was in Kenya a couple of months ago and sort of talked to people building web software there and you know, they have access to the same tools, the same software, the same you know, resources, everything that, that, that we do uh, through the internet, but, but they just like full stop cannot accept credit cards online. Um, and so I guess we, we, we've really tried to hold off sort of providing a, a date to people because we, we don't want sort of people depending on, on what we're going to do and you know, maybe some roadblock comes up or something and it gets delayed, but I mean, I can say that it's the most important problem we're, we're working on right now. Um, we launched in Canada back in September, and yeah, I very much what, hope like, more, more markets will happen soon. Just briefly, what are the problems that you're trying to deal with to get into Europe? Yeah, so, so I guess p part of the problem is that it's, w one, we don't know them all up front, like there are sort of Rumsfeldian epistemic unknown unknowns, um, and then, and, and then, so even of the ones we do know, there's just like a lot of them, right? And so part of it is regulatory. Uh, like one of the most important things about Stripe is that anybody should, or, or almost anybody should be, should be able to start accepting credit card payments online immediately. Um, that, that's not how things work in, in most of the world. That's not how things worked before Stripe. And so we sort of need to convince regulators and banks and credit card networks and all these folks that people should be able to, like, to, to start their business immediately. And that's kind of, that instant gratification is in fact really important, just as you should be able to sort of spin up an instance on EC2 immediately. Um, and then part of it is sort of just like the mechanics of it. Of how do we transfer money you know, reliably into a bank account in Europe? And how do we deal with the user has put in their bank account number wrongly, or the transfer is rejected, or whatever it is? And there, there's making sure it sort of works completely uh, in that you know, we, we don't just want to roll out support for like Visa and MasterCard transactions, because that, that, that's a kind of leaky abstraction. We want to support all of the card brands from, from day one. Uh, we, don't, we want to sort of launch half products. Um, and then, and then there's kind of support questions, language barriers, and just there's a fairly, like it, most companies when they go international, it, it's fairly complicated when you're also dealing with the movement of money. It, it, it's, it, there's a lot of it there. And in fact, I was talking to somebody uh, yesterday who was sort of describing how at their company it had taken eight years to go to Europe and they're not touching money. Wow. And so uh, we definitely don't intend for, for it to be eight years, but it's, there's a lot there. Um, I was reading an, a blog post last week by Fred Wilson, and the basic premise of what he wrote was that if you're a service provider um, and you're catering completely or majorly to a market of startups, that you're exposing yourself quite a lot to customers that are transient or customers that don't have any money. I mean, surely Stripe, uh, I wouldn't say completely, but a lot of your, a large customer segment is startups. And how, what would your reaction to be to that statement? Yeah. I think in general that's, that's sort of something, something to, to think about if, if in fact that is your market and yes, startups certainly were sort of hugely represented among Stripe's early users and are still probably kind of overly represented, represented kind of relative to you know, a, a uniform cross-section of, of online services or something like that. Um, you know, from our standpoint, the ones that are sort of most important to Stripe that you know, drive the most traffic or payments or users or whatever uh, are kind of definitionally the successful ones, the ones who are least likely to go away. And so I think maybe if, if sort of you're offering some service where uh, the, the chance of the, of, of, the st of the startup wanting to use your service was kind of independent of their success, that might yeah. be problematic. But sort of if, if, I don't know, people talk about the Series A crunch or the startup funding environment drying up or something like that, if that were to happen, I think that that sort of, you know, that'll mean that the startups that haven't been able to you know, solve the revenue problem or, or whatever it is, you know, are, maybe a bunch of those will go away, but, but they're not the ones who, who sort of really drive Stripe success, and so I think that, you know, that that's, that's a little bit less of an issue for us. It's Darwinian, basically. Um, the, 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 <laughs> the startup environment is pretty unforgiving. Yeah, I guess. Um, 
Okay, well, I'd like to, I suppose, wrap up on the last one and really ask. Um, really, when is Stripe coming to Ireland? Uh, <laughs> no. Um, what, like, put it to you this way. I, like, I've, I've read about you and your brother, and it seems as if there are not a whole lot of really, really, really notable um, failures. I mean, surely you've probably been, you've swam against the tide a lot over the last few years, but following on from that, what is the biggest thing that you've learned um, since you began Stripe itself? In your role, um, for your role in the company. Yeah. Um, so, so one that just, I was reminded of a couple of days ago uh, is uh, how long it takes to hire people and, and like uh, for, I think for pretty much everybody, um, there, are, there are people that you, uh, you, know, you, you know to be really good and you would really like to work with at some point. Uh, and I don't know, maybe you, you're working on something and you kind of ping them and they're like, oh no, I, I'm doing this thing or I'm doing my own startup or I'm at this job or, or whatever it is. Um, and, and it is possible to get those people, but it takes a really long time. Uh, two days ago, somebody who I mean, has been a friend for five or six years and who we've basically been trying to hire for the entire history of Stripe agreed to join after, so I mean like two and a half years into Stripe. Uh, he, Quite a long he, lead cycle. Yeah, he, <laughs> he, he agreed to join. Uh, and so, and that, that, that experience has been sort of repeated um, throughout Stripe. You know, we, we've a bunch of people who took more than a year to convince to join. Uh, I think that kind of abstracting a level, like the, the meta point there is I, I think, like, even, I, I think from the outside sort of Stripe looks like sort of a, a pretty obvious, or, or some, it, it, it looks pretty successful, right? In that, I mean, I guess we built a product and at least some people like the product and, and it grew, you know, decently for at least the first year, right? It's, it's at least not an utter failure yet. Um, and, but like, even sort of given that, startups are incredibly hard and like for, for most of Stripe, you know, there's always like some major problem and you don't know how to solve it and you're, you're sort of constantly struggling against these. And so I sort of think that, um, I mean, I, I think it's very easy and I mean, this goes for Stripe too, you know, you, you hear about other startups like Airbnb or Dropbox or Pinterest or Twitter or whatever, they're just, they're, they're really hard. Uh, and I think, I mean, so, so like with imposter syndrome where you, you always sort of think that, uh, you know, you, you're the odd one out, everyone's amazing and, and, you, and you're, you're sort of the one faking it. I, I think there's kind of a startup version of that where like every other startup looks like it's having this immensely easy time and sort of you're the one struggling with all these problems. I, I'm pretty convinced that, that all startups are like that and just, <laughs> I, think, I think it's at least somewhat reassuring to know that, that, that you're, you're Yeah, you're you have probably to walk down, like metaphorically, you have to walk down a lot of dark alleyways before you realize that you've got something. You know, up. Startups are hard. Yeah. Startups are hard. Yeah. Well, I mean, on, that, on that optimistic note. <laughs> well, uh, on that optimistic note, we're going to leave it. But um, we're going to take a few questions from the, uh, from the floor, if that's okay. Um, so if anyone wants a qu has a question for Patrick, we're happy to take it. This lady over here, Joni. Hi. With all the things that you could have created, what initiated the spark to make you want to do processing? Uh, so, yeah, I guess... In the question is sort of what made us want to start Stripe. Um, so actually, the reason we started Stripe and the reason we stayed working on it were actually a little bit different. Uh, we decided to start it because just we had run into this problem ourselves. Like we were developers, we you know, tried to launch online services. It had always been incredibly hard to, to make money for them. So being poor college students, like the, the, the notion of making money for the things we built online was, was reasonably attractive to us. And so we, we kind of built this quick prototype of Stripe. Um, but we, we, it was sort of a side project for us initially, and we didn't think that it was necessarily all that big a deal. It was just kind of a, a nice little service. Um, the thing that made us continue uh, to, to, to work on it or, or kind of like really make it a focus was kind of realizing that it's not just a problem of kind of credit card acceptance or payment processing or, or a problem for developers. It's sort of like an overall problem for the internet. It's sort of there, there, there really should be this kind of universal, ubiquitous like transaction layer for the internet. It should be sort of possible for anybody to pay anybody else for sort of a thing they make or, or what they create or serve or, or, like, or whatever it is. And it's the, like, <laughs> that people have always kind of known this about the internet, that sort of that there, there should be this really, again, good, robust, trustable, easy to integrate infrastructure. Um, and it just didn't exist. Uh, and it's sort of one of the biggest drawbacks of the internet today, that, that it's in fact immensely hard to sort of, to, to, to be kind of economically compensated for stuff you do. And I think that holds kind of every facet of the internet back, sort of no matter what you're doing. Uh, and so kind of once we realized and, and decided that it was one of the biggest problems kind of left on the internet, uh, internet um, you know, that was pretty compelling to us. Okay, any more? Um, this gentleman down here in the middle. 
Uh, it's not exactly a question, but please go to Brazil. Go abroad. We need you there, you guys there. You know, the payment systems from Europe and even from Brazil, they're rubbish. And many developers struggle. Like, I, we have developer communities which say, we want Stripe in Brazil, for sure. We will definitely come to Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could give an answer. If, if you know people who should work at Stripe to help bring it to Brazil, you should drop us an email. Okay. Uh, we, we saw the uh, Irish government at TechCrunch this year, and they were trying to get tech businesses to go out to Ireland and set up. So you're an Irish guy who's come here. Did you incorporate in Ireland, or are you incorporated here? Um, we're a U.S. company. Uh, but sorry, was the question like, which are we, or which would I recommend? Well, the, the Irish are obviously trying to get people to go over there and set up tech businesses. They right. were talking Limerick with us. Um, so you've chosen not to set up in Ireland, but to come here. Is that, uh, what's the environment like there? What's the environment like here? What brought you here? I think for sort of the, the kind of business that Stripe is, sort of a, a very kind of pure technology startup, um, I personally at least wouldn't have been able to pull that off in Ireland. Uh, like, I, I don't think that we'd have been able to get the kind of finance deals we needed to get done in Ireland. I don't think we'd have, I mean, there's just no question. We would not have been able to hire the kind of people that we've been able to hire in, in Silicon Valley back in Ireland. And, and I couldn't have made it work. Um, I, I don't think that goes for, for all startups um, or, or for all technology companies, but uh, I guess, I, it's not so much that I sort of think Ireland's a bad place as I think m most places that aren't Silicon Valley are, are probably a bad place. Um, and uh, you know, I think it's a sort of a very interesting question as to how, how can you change that or how can you improve it or sort of what, what causes it to be sort of a center of gravity or mass or whatever in, in different locations. But uh, I think for sort of the kinds of companies that are famous here, like the Airbnbs and the Dropboxes and the Facebooks and Googles and all of those, I think I mean, there, there aren't many elsewhere, and I think there aren't many elsewhere for, for pretty good reasons. Like, it, it's not just that those people decided to move here, it's also that the, the versions of those people who started elsewhere did not make it. Okay. What do you think of the um, potential for alternative payment methods like ACH and things like what Dwala is building to disrupt the payment industry, and does Stripe have plans for that? Yeah, I, th I think that's... Um, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that sort of, uh, kind of whatever ends up happening long term or again kind of forming this, this ubiquitous network um, will not just be credit cards. Um, and, and sort of, it's kind of an open question as to you know, whether that's ATH or whether it's sort of, I mean there's, there's various kind of debit instruments and stuff in, in particular countries like Germany and Holland. Um, uh, but, but I think kind of the, the really important point is that you can sort of jump up an abstraction level so that you're, you're not reliant on any one of those becoming ubiquitous, but you can sort of do something that, that enables you to kind of switch in different ones. Um, we have this gentleman over here. Thanks, Kyle. That was a great hustle. Um, I'm interested in, in what you see as kind of your mission on Earth and uh, how Stripe fits into that. If there's one thing you do in your lifetime, I mean, there are probably many that you think are worth doing for humanity on a grand scale. How does Stripe fit into that? Interesting. And, and we haven't even had a drink yet. Um, <laughs> uh, hopefully, can do more than one thing. And, I mean, the reason we think Stripe really matters is we think that the internet really matters. Uh, the internet, I think, is basically the most sort of important phenomenon of, of our time. Uh, and I think that, I mean, it's easy to sort of look at payments as sort of a very kind of narrow transactional thing and like kind of who particularly cares about a payment. But of course, a payment is just sort of like the way we incentivize each other to like do the things that matter in life. And w I mean, <laughs> we think that it's really important that that is possible uh, on the internet and, and it sort of, like, there, was a, uh, there was a brief window on the internet where, where payments were not possible and it was, it, was, it was a much poorer thing. And if you sort of compare the internet sort of in, the, in the US where sort of it, I mean, we, we can transact in this, transact in this, this sort of incredible fountain of creativity and sort of people starting businesses or people selling things on Etsy or selling projects on Kickstarter or whatever, like it's, it's really meaningful stuff. So sort of what, what this enables is for people to, 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 to do the things that they're passionate about and they care about. And I think that, you know, the internet is kind of interesting because it's not only kind of a shift on, on sort of, 
it, it doesn't just change kind of how these happen. Like it's not, it's not like mail order. It's, yeah, you could go to the store or, or you could like buy the thing from a catalog. It just fundamentally kind of through the network dynamics changes what is possible. Like there was no version of Kickstarter or Etsy or whatever it is w w without having the internet. And so, I mean, if you, if, if you think that's true, if you think that sort of the internet kind of changes what, what's possible for sort of us collectively as a species to do, then I think it's, it's kind of self-evidently pretty important to, to kind of go build the economic infrastructure that, that facilitates that. And I think in general, like that, that's kind of the, the arc of human history, right? In that if you, if you sort of look at what kind of the major discontinuities and inflection points were, it was like we all band together in cities, like we, we, we form Satal Hoyak or whatever, and we, um, we, we decide that specialization is a good idea and we should have some amount of commerce or trade or whatever, and we don't just all have to be gathering our food. I think that sort of the internet is the, um, the, the kind of the, the culmination of sort of that general trend uh, through history, uh, you know, to date. Um, I think that's pretty important, but I guess it, this, this can all get pretty meta-philosophical pretty quickly. God, I'd love to hear that answer if you did have a drink. Um, <laughs> that's great. Um, any more questions for Patrick? One more. Hi, thanks for your presentation. So I used to work at a very large technology company up in Seattle and went through a horrible, terrifying deck on payment methods used globally. Um, and as a startup now, I desperately want someone else to make that deck go away. Um, and one of the things that was in it was how much of payments are handled through very bizarre offline mechanisms in a lot of the developing world. I was curious if, how you think about tackling that. Yeah. So I think that in general, in, in many of those countries, uh, things are pretty quickly moving away from those and sort of towards instruments that, that support kind of some kind of real-time authorization. So the question is, is basically kind of, uh, like, or the, the fundamental kind of split is, uh, you know, payment instruments where maybe you, you collect the money on delivery or in person or asynchronously or something like that, as opposed to payment instruments where you can sort of receive the money instantaneously. I think it's probably a safe assumption that in most of the world, pretty quickly, there will be real-time auth payment instruments or things where you can get the money immediately. It's possible that that'll take a while, and I think kind of it'll be an, an interesting question for us, you know, as we think of, think of expanding to somewhere like India, for example, uh, w whether or not we try to do something there. But I think it is very important that we present a fairly coherent and consistent set of abstractions to developers and sort of introducing the, this, this like gushing leak of, oh, and you know, if it's this parent instrument, you don't actually have the money yet, or you might never get the money, would be problematic. And so I guess we're kind of hoping that most of the world will, will support kind of that fundamental capability of the real-time auth um, by the time that we get there. And, and it, it, it'll be, yeah, it, 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 it'll be a t pretty tough set of trade-offs um, <laughs> uh, if it doesn't happen in time. Okay, well, um, on that note, I would like to, uh, again, thanks for, thank you for coming along, and uh, we hope to see you back in Ireland uh, very soon. Yes, right. definitely. Thank you very uh, much. Thanks, Patrick. <laughs>